Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we examine efforts to protect and preserve our environment. In California, we look at how the Salton Sea could be a valuable source of lithium used in electric car batteries. And in Florida, we take a deep dive into the multi-billion dollar restoration project to save the Everglades. But we begin in Alaska, where environmentalists are warning a proposed copper mine could threaten the largest bald eagle habitat in the country. Jonathan Vigliotti travels to the frontier state to learn more. Every November, an American icon returns to Alaska's Chilkat River to roost. It's akin to being on the Serengeti and watching the, the migration of the wildebeest. The town of Haines is the gateway to the largest bald eagle habitat in the U.S. This wildlife preserve, a migratory mecca. This is the greatest concentration of bald eagles anywhere on the planet. At times, we've counted up to 4,000 individuals. It's a phenomenon photographer Mario Benassi says is made possible by geothermal springs, which prevent the river from freezing leaving the salmon that run through it ripe for picking. But upstream, there's a potential new threat. It could be the end of this singularity and this gathering. The state recently permitted a mining company to explore extracting copper. It's a move the governor says will create jobs. But environmentalists are sounding the alarm. There's basically no mines out there that, have, that don't pollute. Clean water advocate and Haines resident Gershon Cohen is most concerned that there might be toxic runoff damaging the Chilkat. According to the EPA, mining has contributed to the contamination of 40% of the country's rivers. If the mine were to happen and anything would happen to the salmon, basically everything else collapses. Including, Cohen says, the eagle's habitat. In an email to CBS News, American Pacific Mining, the company leading the project, said it's committed to operating responsibly and respecting protected areas and species, including the bald eagles. Most native Alaskans, who also depend on salmon, are not sold. On a good day years ago, how many salmon would you expect to get? in just one of these trips with the net. So probably 20 to 30 fish is, is what, what you could probably do. Hank and Kim Strong's empty net highlights what studies show. Climate change is already taking a toll on the fish population. Why take that risk? Do you gamble? I don't go to Las Vegas to gamble. I don't, I don't wanna gamble here either. We turn now to one of the most dreaded times of the year for many Americans, I can relate, allergy season. A recent study found heavy pollen affects Americans 20 days longer per year compared to three decades ago. National correspondent Dave Malkoff investigates why spring allergies are lasting longer and getting worse. Dallas is getting a bit wild, but it's not dog hair that's clogging up Dick Morrison's head. It's the severe pollen season. It's just longer. So where it used to be two weeks, now it's about three months. Roughly 60 million people in the U.S. suffer from allergies, Say, uh, oh, including sir? Michael Welsh. For him, just getting through the day requires a weekly custom-mixed allergy shot. What happens if you don't get that shot once a week? My allergies go wild. I get watery eyes, a running nose, I start sneezing. Pollen really is everywhere. This is not just you. In fact, between 1990 and 2018, there was a 21% increase in pollen. That study done by Professor William Andrick. Pollen seasons are starting earlier and getting worse with more pollen in the air. Is this because of the heat? Is this because of the extra carbon in the air? It seems to be a combination of everything, but that said, it really seems like the heat is one of the biggest drivers. This past winter was the warmest on record across the continental U.S. Fewer days below freezing, allowing plants to bloom earlier and longer. New data released from the nonprofit Climate Central shows allergy season coast to coast is growing. 
For Portland, the 2023 season was 23 days longer when compared to 1970. In Philly, it's 31 days. In Dallas, it's 17 days longer. At Dr. Brett West's office, that's led to a 30% uptick in patients this year. And if you're thinking, I don't get allergies like everyone else. It's just because you never had dog or cat or pollen allergies growing up. It can develop at any time. Coming up, how the site of past environmental disasters could be a key to America's clean energy future. This is Eye on America. Welcome back. The Salton Sea is a man-made lake created in 1905 by accident in California's Imperial Valley. Over the years, drought and pollution have had devastating impacts on the surrounding communities. But as John Blackstone shows us, resources from the region could help meet the growing demand for electric vehicles. In California's Imperial Valley, the Salton Sea, the state's largest lake, has been shrinking for years, leaving a toxic, dusty shoreline. But now there's growing confidence the arid land around the Salton Sea holds a vast supply of lithium. It's a very significant, sort of what we call a world-class lithium resource. Geologist Pat Dobson led a recent federal study of Salton Sea lithium reserves. And that represents enough lithium to manufacture hundreds of millions of EV batteries. So it's a huge potential resource. The move to electric vehicles has created a worldwide search for lithium to make batteries. But lithium around the Salton Sea has been no secret. And we've known that for, for, for decades, but what didn't happen before is there was not a great demand for lithium. For 40 years, lithium has been treated as an unwanted byproduct by geothermal power plants in the area. The plants produce electricity by tapping superheated fluid called brine a mile beneath the Earth's surface. The brine produces steam and then is injected back into the Earth. Lithium is one of the minerals in the brine. For decades, we've been pulling lithium out of the ground and then putting it back. And so what we're looking at now is the opportunity to recover that lithium from the geothermal brine and utilize it for making batteries. And that is bringing hope to Imperial Valley where unemployment is high, wages are low, and agriculture is the dominant industry. This is something big for the valley, you know what I mean? Because we never really have nothing of our own, so. Johnny Haywood is one of those in a night class at Imperial Valley College, training mature students for jobs in the lithium industry. Some here, like David Maldato, are farm workers. We work in the fields in the daytime? In the daytime and at night I come to school. Sammy Gonzalez and his father Jose both worked in the fields and are now looking for something better. It's a great opportunity. It's a, yeah, it's a great opportunity, right? And I, I'm so happy because we are studying Together. And I don't want uh, any industry to say we have to bring outside people because there's not a, a ready workforce in Imperial County. Efren Silva, dean at Imperial Valley College, created the training program for lithium industry jobs. We hope and expect that there will be other industries joining the lithium industry, such as battery manufacturing. The Imperial Valley dreams of becoming Lithium Valley, but the Salton Sea is a reminder of lost opportunities here. If you go back to a map of California in 1880, there is no Salton Sea in the Salton Sea. The Salton Sea was an accident created in 1905 when a levee broke and water from the Colorado River poured into the valley. In the 1950s, it became a popular tourist destination. But that faded over the years as the lake became polluted with agricultural runoff and grew twice as salty as the Pacific Ocean. As a lake in the desert, the Salton Sea is important to wildlife, particularly birds on the Pacific Flyway which is why in the 1990s, the local congressman campaigned vigorously to save the Salton Sea. The congressman was Sonny Bono. Yes, that Sonny Bono. I got you, babe. Sonny and Cher's popularity in the 1960s boosted Bono's political profile when he ran for Congress in 1994. His efforts helped prompt the Salton Sea Restoration Act, but the act didn't become law until months after Bono died in a skiing accident in 1998. Although the act directed the government to reclaim the Salton Sea, it has continued to shrink as water is diverted from the Imperial Valley to cities in the San Diego area. But now lithium could change everything. This is the magic. 
This is, this is where the magic happens in terms of lithium extractions. David Deke is with Energy Source Minerals, one of the companies developing methods for collecting lithium from geothermal brine. So each of these columns will contain absorbent that absorbs lithium into it. This demonstration unit is in a shipping container, but the company is planning a facility that will be the size of a thousand shipping containers. So you're confident yeah. this is going to work a thousand times bigger. Exactly. It, it, highly confident. So optimistically, the first commercially available lithium from your plant is at least two years away? I would say that, yes, yeah. If we close on financing and start construction immediately thereafter, we'll be in production and delivering to customers by uh, 2026. In a region that has known plenty of hard times, there's a chance this time will be different. We stay in California where the largest dam removal project in U.S. history is currently underway. Ben Tracy heads to Klamath River to better understand the complex efforts to revive this vital ecosystem. One of our oldest stories talks about the connection between us and the river and the salmon in it. Frankie Myers is a member of the Yurok tribe, Native Americans who for 10,000 years have been tied to the Klamath River and the abundant salmon that once swam through it. Without salmon in the river, there's no need for Yurok people to be here. But this essential artery was blocked more than a century ago when construction started on four dams along the Klamath. They generated power that fueled western expansion but decimated the salmon population, which could no longer swim upstream to spawn. Stagnant water behind the dams became a toxic stew of green algae. And so what have these dams symbolized to you? As a monument to manifest destiny, this idea that we're not a part of nature. It's here for our use, and we could do whatever we want with no consequences. If you guys want to have war, let's have war. Now, after decades of conflict and tribal activism against the dams, the once shackled Klamath is being set free. The dams, which no longer generate much electricity, are being torn down in a $450 million deconstruction project. We're standing on top of a lot of concrete. It's a lot of concrete. That's what it took to impound this river. Mark Bransom is CEO of the Klamath Renewal Corporation. How big of a project is this to take down these four dams? We believe it may be the largest dam removal and salmon restoration project ever undertaken anywhere in the world. At the base of another dam, hundreds of thousands of tiny hatchery salmon were killed, likely by high water pressure as they passed through a tunnel open to let the river flow through. Once the dams are completely removed, native salmon populations are expected to return, and seeds are now being spread to regrow plants on land drowned here decades ago. Literally planting seeds for our future. I don't think there's a better metaphor that you could come up with. Bringing hope back to the banks of this river. Ahead, we take you inside what's being called the largest environmental restoration project in human history. That story is next. We close our show exploring efforts to reverse years of devastation in the Florida Everglades. The region is home to hundreds of endangered plant and animal species, but some experts say the wetlands are on life support. Jeff Glor sees how billions of dollars will be put to work to help rehabilitate this environment. The largest restoration project in human history. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, 68 major infrastructure projects totaling more than $25 billion. $25 billion is the kind of investment Stephen Davis says is needed to fix decades of damage to one of the world's great wonders. The liquid heart of this area is Lake Okeechobee, the big water. Damage caused in part by a well-meaning operation intended to relieve repeated flooding of rich Florida farmland. This is a project of mammoth proportions, one that calls for more than 700 miles of new levees throughout the central and southern Florida area. And it was really the central and southern Florida project that just had devastating impacts on this ecosystem. 
Davis is the chief science officer of the Everglades Foundation. What happened to the Everglades? They basically disconnected Lake Okeechobee from the Everglades ecosystem, and so this part of the ecosystem is deprived of that fresh water. So for decades, South Florida just hasn't gotten enough water. Exactly. And with each water crisis we have, whether it's blue-green algae, exacerbation of red tide, fires out in the Everglades, seagrass die-off in Florida Bay and around the Keys, there's a growing awareness of the need to replumb South Florida. Replumbing South Florida includes building a reservoir that's costing about $4 billion just by itself. That is the entire footprint of this project. We got a bird's eye view thanks to the nonprofit group Lighthawk. You describe the reservoir as heart bypass surgery. Exactly. It's, it's the means of reconnecting Lake Okeechobee, which is really described by many as the beating heart of this ecosystem. It reconnects the heart back to the body, which is the Everglades, the river of grass. Work is also moving along on a project to raise the Tamiami Trail Road. Built in 1928, the road cut off almost all water flow into the southern Everglades. Perhaps the biggest impediment? The Everglades remain a boon for big business. Most people are surprised to hear drilling still takes place in the Everglades. And it's long been a hugely productive spot for the sugar industry. How big of a problem does the sugar industry remain when it comes to the Everglades and a healthy Everglades? Really through a variety of means. One, they're a source of pollution to the Everglades. And uh, the state has had to respond by building tens of thousands of wetlands treatment marshes to clean up the pollution that run off those fields before it gets into the Everglades. That's where a project overseen by Lawrence Glenn of the South Florida Water Management District comes in. We're standing in the middle of the cleansing. Yes. What's really cool about this, there's so much science going on in here to understand how we cleanse this water that you don't normally think of. Plants like this are pulling out phosphorus from billions of gallons of water, helping to make sure what flows south is safe to drink and healthy enough to feed this enormous ecosystem. This is what's doing the work. Yes. 63,000 acres of man-made wetlands, largest constructed wetland in the world. Doesn't smell the best, no. <laughs> but, but this is great stuff. And uh, when we were planning this project, no one had built constructed wetlands on this size. We didn't know if it was gonna work. This treatment marsh is being paid for by the state, with a portion covered by a tax on polluters like Big Sugar. Overall, on the larger project, all of us are contributing. A lot of the money coming in is federal money. Why should someone in Iowa care about the health of the Everglades thousands of miles away? Well, for a variety of reasons. Um, this is a biodiversity hotspot. It's also a uh, carbon sponge. Th this ecosystem, three million acres, uh, takes up greenhouse gases from the atmosphere when it's hydrated, when it's kept wet, which is what Everglades restoration does. Sequestering carbon is an important functional value of the Everglades. It's the water supply for more than 9 million Americans. Uh, and it's also a place that people from all across the world like to visit. There are so many stakeholders involved here, including the native people who were here before anyone else. Talbert Cypress is chairman of the Miccosukee tribe. The Miccosukee hid in the Everglades when the U.S. Army tried to move them to Oklahoma in the 1800s. He considers himself a steward of the land that protected his ancestors. When I look out at this, it looks natural. Is, is it? No, right now this water is very high for this time of year. This is the dry season right now, so you can imagine if it starts raining a lot, like during the summer this tree island would get flooded once rainy season comes along. And that also affects the wildlife too. When the water gets high, the wildlife can move to higher ground. Mm -hmm. But when this water is in the way, they can't do that. And so a lot of wildlife will drown or, you know, they can't get access to food. Mm -hmm. And the quality of water coming through is very poor as well. That may change soon. 
Obstacles remain, but infrastructure work is well underway. Lawrence Glenn says the reservoir, for example, is scheduled to be done by 2030. How long do you think it will take for the Everglades to be in a place where you want it to be? And I'm saying probably 2040, you start to see an Everglades that really looks like the Everglades did historically. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news, stream us right here on CBS News 24-7. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.